It is no small, enchanting South Sea Island. It is a vast territory with all the physical resources any country could desire. There are mountains and valleys, rivers and lakes, jungles and plains, and thousands of miles of shoreline shaded by coconut palms. The coastal sections of New Guinea are largely equatorial jungle country. Those regions have been touched most by civilization. In the rugged interior, only scattered outposts are found among the mountains which rise up to 14,000 feet above the Pacific. There are people living in New Guinea who are just as primitive as the countryside. Their minds have been filled with fear and superstition. Their lives have had little meaning or purpose. Their souls have been lost because they have not known Jesus Christ. Therefore, Lutheran missionaries have been bringing the gospel to more and more of them ever since 1886. Mission work was going forward nicely when in December 1942, war came to New Guinea. Some missionaries did not escape the enemy and were captured. Eleven of them were martyred. The mission field was almost a total loss, with homes, churches, hospitals, stores, and ships completely destroyed. All the destruction, however, did not destroy the faith of the Christian natives. Those who had been influenced by the teaching of the missionaries continued to meet for worship, even though they had to do it in the outdoors where heavy rains are common. The mission was gone, but the church was still there. When peace returned, a memorial service was held at the Finchhofen Cemetery in honor of the thousands of Allied war dead. Mission Superintendent John Cooter, a veteran missionary on the island, and the first to return after the war, joined with the military and civilians in paying tribute. Australian troops offered a salute over 10,000 white crosses. Missionaries lay buried side by side with soldiers beneath these crosses. The American flag was flying half-mast. It was the airplane which rained destruction down upon mission property. For the natives to see an airplane approaching during the war, it meant fear and pain, perhaps even death. But man can turn the same powerful instrument into missions of peace. Lutheran Mission New Guinea was now to be reactivated. Missionaries began to return to the island. The Americans once again invaded New Guinea this time bringing Bibles instead of bombs. The cry, Ayo, go forward, was once again the Christian theme. Among the first to arrive were the wives and children of missionaries John Cooter and Albert Frerichs, who had to wait at home in America until homes could be built for them at the mission. Many people were needed to do the work which the mission had been assigned by the home churches. Into the mission came Americans, Canadians, Australians, and Germans. They were carpenters, electricians, printers, farmers, school teachers, 
doctors, nurses, pharmacists, electronic experts, and seamen, as well as ordained ministers. Veteran missionaries were happy to return to their former fields of labor. Happier still were the natives who lined up for the welcoming handshake. Native pastors and elders led in prayer, thanking God for the return of their beloved missionaries. The destruction to mission property was disheartening to those who first saw it. What had once been a beautiful store building in Medang was now only a skeleton riddled by shells and bombs. Reconstruction must begin immediately. In 1945, Dr. T.P. Fricke, then the commissioner of the Board of Foreign Missions of the American Lutheran Church, and later its executive secretary, made an inspection tour of New Guinea. He saw all that needed to be done to build the mission to its pre-war stature. He saw the materials that the Allied armies had left in New Guinea. So he made arrangements for the purchase of trucks, jeeps, mobile machine shops, lumber, galvanized iron, tools of all descriptions, and other building supplies. But this equipment without men to make use of it would be of no value. Young Luther Leaguers from America and Australia volunteered two years of their lives to serve as carpenters and to operate heavy equipment. New young lives were to be dedicated to the work of rebuilding Christianity on the second largest island in the world. The material purchased from the army was located at Finchhofen, headquarters of the pre-war mission operated by the Neuendettelsau Mission Society of Germany. It is now a part of the unified Lutheran mission, New Guinea. From Finchhofen, much of the material was transported to Medang and other points along the eastern coast. Ocean freighters were chartered to move it. Over 1,700 tons went on this load. There aren't many roads in New Guinea, but a few are necessary to move supplies from one settlement to another and to connect some of the stations. Some of the short-term missionaries operated bulldozers and heavy road equipment. Out of dense jungle they had to build roads. Ayo was the cry. They must go forward and obstacles must be removed. Our missionaries are there to build roads of peace and happiness. They build roads over which the gospel of Jesus Christ can travel, travel not only to the villages of New Guinea, but also to the hearts of New Guinea's unredeemed people. After building materials had been delivered to mission station sites, actual construction could begin. Hand-mixed cement is used for foundations. Forms are filled with cement and posts are built. These concrete posts serve to elevate houses from the ground, thus allowing ventilation from beneath the floor. Termites cannot work on them like they do on average bush houses, and therefore the structure is more permanent. Framework was erected, much work being done by willing natives who were eager to see the mission get into operation once more. Native cooperation and assistance 
accounted for much of the success of the rapid reconstruction project. Comfortable homes for missionaries were finished. Not every convenience was available, and not every home is as attractive as these, but they are comfortable and adequate. Churches, schools, hospitals, stores, and a print shop were also built. One of the most thrilling phases of mission work is the medical. A fine hospital had been established at Amelie, but was completely shattered during the war. Only an empty shell now stands where once life-saving medication and surgery were administered. Dr. Theodore Brown and his wife, a nurse, were captured by the Japanese during the war. Told far and wide is the heroism of this couple in saving the lives of others while almost losing their own. In the company of veteran missionary Emil Hahnemann, Dr. Brown returns to Amelie and its residents. They are grateful to God, who in his providence returned their beloved doctor to them. One of the immediate needs on the mission field was a complete hospital for natives and whites in the Medang area. Using materials purchased from the army, the reconstruction crew went to work. They did such a good job that on July 23, 1950, Superintendent John Cooter could dedicate one of the finest mission hospitals anywhere. Carved out of dense jungle in only two years' time, there stands now on the Yagam Hospital compound several native wards, a surgical building, a pharmacy laboratory, dispensary, European hospital, homes, offices, libraries, and kitchens. Complete surgery equipment is located in two theaters complete with observation rooms for the use of medical trainees. Patients are brought to the hospital in many ways from many directions. Expert surgery is assured when the team of Dr. and Mrs. Brown are performing skillful operations on one of any number of ailments found among the people of New Guinea. The good doctor takes pleasure in reporting the hospital's work to other missionaries in conference. Dr. Brown is also Teacher Brown while in a classroom at the hospital. He is teaching anatomy to a group of native boys who will someday be medical assistants in the hospital or in villages on the island. There are trainees also at the hospital at Finchhofen where veteran Dr. Agnes Hager has supervised medical work. When the young men go out to put their medical knowledge into practice, they gain valuable experience and render valuable service to the ill and diseased. Education is vital to the function of the Christian Church. It is especially so in a foreign mission field. Children and adults alike need and want to learn so many things. Lutheran Mission New Guinea provides schools and teachers. Taught there are many of the same subjects that our schools teach here in America. The teachers are quick to tell that little Papuan children are as lovable as those of any other nationality. Mrs. Ottilie Welsh is proud of these girls of her school. Female education is important, since the girls will be the wives of future teachers and evangelists. At Hamran, missionary Hahnemann teaches these future leaders in the church. They have their tables and chairs, blackboards and chalk, slates and books. These boys possess an intelligence which is easily displayed once they are given the opportunity to learn. Someday, in the not too distant future, these young men and others like them will become the clergy of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of New Guinea.
natives enjoy music. They have the ability to play most musical instruments and enjoy playing in a band. Native police boys at Pinchhofen have been trained into a fine band by a young man from Australia. Several of the short-term missionaries sent by the Luther League volunteered to stay on as full-time missionaries. One such was Louis Winter. When he knew that New Guinea would be his permanent home, he sent for his fiancée, Miss Theora Drews. Not long after his young lady arrived on the field, they were united in marriage. Another Christian home was established on the frontier of civilization. Life goes on in New Guinea as in any other part of the world, and the white baby is a great novelty something to be enjoyed by curious natives. Water travel is vital to mission work along the coast. Often there is no other transportation available. The mission owns ships and boats of various sizes and types. Missionary Fred Shirley and his native helpers have constructed this small launch for the Malolo station. Boats not only transport members of the staff and native Christians, but also bring supplies from the central warehouses to outlying missions along the coast. Transportation is a big problem, since there are dense jungles and swift rivers between stations. Modern missionaries are thankful that they do not have to depend entirely on such flimsy native bridges when they travel, as did their predecessors. Often, even these bridges are missing. Whereas it formerly took days and weeks of strenuous hiking over mountains and through jungles, the airplane now makes a trip to the highlands a matter of hours. Without the airplane, the mission could not go forward nearly as rapidly. The most primitive people live in the mountains of New Guinea, yet they are providing the most fertile soil in which our missionaries may plant the seed of the word. The people who have been held by the bonds of fear and superstition for generations have begun to see a great light. Men and women of the gospel have come to them. They have come bringing with them a book called the Bible. Marvelous words have been read to them from this book. The missionaries even teach them to read the Bible in their own language. It is no wonder that the strange white people are the center of attention. Pastor and Mrs. Ralph Goldhart are surrounded by natives in their mountain station. Here at Mission Station Osaloka in the Central Highlands, a supply of water was needed. The closest supply was in the mountains, five miles away. Friendly natives provided the manual labor willingly digging a concourse all that distance so that water could flow by gravity to the station. This again shows how God has opened the hearts of New Guinea's natives to the missionaries and their message. Lumber was needed to rebuild the destroyed stations and to establish new ones. Timber was plentiful, but it had to be prepared. Huge trees were felled and pit sawed in the forest.
Some were stripped and pulled by teams of men to the site of the mission station. Ayo, they shout, as they work hard for their church. Upon reaching their destination, the logs were turned over to native carpenters who pit-sawed them into planks and boards. Power tools are not always available. Imagine the time and work that would go into the construction of a house this size using these primitive methods. These hard-working volunteers wanted the mission to go forward. A second house was built at Osiloka and was occupied by Pastor and Mrs. E. P. Helbig, veterans of 44 years in New Guinea. With physical needs thus supplied, the spiritual ministry is able to go forward. Crowds begin to gather for outdoor services. Since many must walk miles and miles through mountain and forest, they sometimes start a day or two ahead of the scheduled date so that they will be sure to arrive in time for the service. Crowds of up to 5,000 sometimes congregate at mission centers. These simple people are eager to hear the gospel preached by the missionaries and native teachers and evangelists. These men and their families are teachers provided by native congregations to teach the heathen in new areas. They are doing a splendid job, and without them our mission could not go forward. The short-termers worked in the Central Highlands during part of their stay in New Guinea. But it was not always work. The Luther Leaguers took with them the great American game of football. That was something for the natives to see, for it was different from anything that they had ever played. Now it was their turn to learn. The fundamentals of the game were taught to them, and they caught on very quickly. They had their recreation too, and they richly deserved some fun while they worked so diligently for the mission. But they must take a few more instructions from their missionary coaches before they are ready for real competition. Mission Station Raipinka has been one of the fastest growing centers since the war. A new church was necessary. Mr. Harvey Hildebrand, a short-term reconstruction worker, supervised the building of a permanent type structure. Ground had to be leveled for the foundation, so he invented a human bulldozer. Manpower was supplied by both men and women of the area. As the church was being erected and the day of dedication drew near, big plans were made for the event. Visitors would be coming from villages far and wide. Accommodations must be provided, so an entire village was built, especially for the guests at the dedication. Food and fuel for their fires were also in readiness. When the day arrived, the church stood complete with cross, bell, and stained glass windows. Every inch of the lumber had been hand-hewn. How proud the natives were of their new church. 
They had built it themselves. Vast crowds lined the road leading to the church. Missionaries Albert Frerix and Max Diemer led a colorful procession of the faithful into their new house of worship. There they offered thanks and praise to a great and wonderful God. Americans attending the event were the Reverend Albert Frerichs and family, Mr. and Mrs. Harvey Hildebrand, the Reverend Max Diemer and family, Mrs. Herbert Walber, and the Reverend and Mrs. Ralph Goldhart. Spiritual harvests have been reaped abundantly in New Guinea. It is the practice to teach the gospel for several years so that all who study know the Christian faith thoroughly. The missionaries or native leaders have worked carefully with all of them. It is the purpose of their being there to teach and preach. Those who are certain that they wish to become disciples of Jesus Christ may receive baptism. Large numbers are baptized together in one service. During this baptismal procession at Raipinka, costume natives precede the candidates for baptism, dancing and singing a special hymn written for the occasion. Dressed in white, they come down the road of faith which the mission has built. They appear spotless in dress. When they receive the sacrament, they will become spotless in soul. Their sins, which include adultery, murder, and cannibalism, will be forgiven. Deep solemnity is expressed on the faces of these new Christians. They are giving up lives of wickedness, war, and bloodshed which they had lived, just as had their ancestors for centuries. At last they had found peace, happiness, and contentment in the love of a Savior. Crowds of thousands attend services like this, and the ushers find it difficult to make room for everyone to be seated in the outdoor chapel. In a pulpit built of bush materials high above the altar, native pastors and teachers exhort the new converts to live the Christ life. The missionary, too, speaks a few words on the new Christian life they were now entering. They must make their theme, Ayo, go forward for Christ. One by one, heads bow before the altar to the heads of all individuals who confess their sins and their fervent faith in Jesus Christ as their savior from sin, the missionary applies water. He baptizes them in the name of the triune God. A tremendous change is taking place. No more will they hold cannibal feasts. No more will they listen to the witch doctor. No more will they put their trust in heathen sorcery. Instead, here is a group of repentant, forgiven, believing Christians. Here are the people who will compose the future Lutheran Church of New Guinea.
this is the result of our missionary labors. This is why men and women devote their lives to the service of God and people of a faraway land. This is why we must continue to support foreign missions. Souls are at stake. Over a hundred thousand natives have been won for Christ in Lutheran Mission New Guinea. Yet there are untold thousands of heathen still existing in nearby areas. They look to us to lead them down the open road of Christian faith, the way which makes possible for them a better life in this world and the world to come. The missionaries cannot do this job alone. They need us, the people in the home church. Our church has magnificent opportunities in New Guinea. It is our challenge to support our missionaries with prayers and gifts. It is our challenge to give ourselves, our money, our sons and daughters for the cause of Christ. It is our challenge to keep the roads of faith open. It is up to us to heed the cry, Ayo, go forward.